What's up guys? I'm Natasha and it is time for our first real official winter garden tour. If you can believe it, we're there. It's happened. Winter has begun. It's awful. I know there's a lot of really good things about the winter and I'm being a tad bit over dramatic. I just, I'm such a baby about the cold. I really, really, really don't care for the cold at all. So we're shooting the garden tour day early actually because the rest of this week, it's supposed to be just tremendously gross and cold outside. So I figured I would take the somewhat, you know, five degree temperature difference with me while we shot the garden tour this week. So the first thing we're gonna be talking about is these turnips that you're gonna see behind me in just a second. So that's what you're seeing in this bed right here, these beautiful green tops. These are the turnips, and then you have cabbages and collards and brassicas all in through here. How beautiful is that turnip right there? So in all actuality, we could probably let these get just a little bit bigger, but because these are the first turnips of winter and I'm super excited about these, I'm gonna pull the ones that are at least this big in diameter and we'll take those inside and we'll roast them up with dinner. But how awesome is that? The sun just came out and it's fabulous. So turnip greens, if you didn't know, are completely edible. I'm sure a lot of you already know that, but if you didn't, they are edible. I don't actually care for the texture because a lot like radish greens are kind of fuzzy. Turnip greens are a bit pokey and I just don't. You can blanch them and it helps a lot. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna give these tops to the chickens though because they will enjoy it and appreciate it. All right, so let's pull some more of these. Oh, also, okay. If you've been wondering how to tell when your turnips are ready to be pulled, this is how. You check your turnips and the diameter is about three to four inches. Those are ready to be harvested. So you may notice that I harvest our turnips a little bit smaller than other people. I find that they are a little bit sweeter and a little bit gentler in flavor when they are a little bit smaller, but you can harvest them whenever you feel comfortable, anywhere from two inches to three to four inches. If you leave them too long, they will get a little rough and woody, so you don't exactly want to do that, but it's your call as a gardener, right? If we continue past our beautiful turnips over here, you'll notice the peas along the backs of these trellises. We are starting to get blooms on those, but we'll check those when we come around to the other side. All of these are just looking really nicely, and these radishes that were planted down here in the back are all starting to come up, which is exciting. You can see a big difference in the cabbages versus your more traditional collards. You can tell by the leaf difference. Now in this bed over here, we have our Swiss chard. And then this is all common arugula, all in through here. Let's talk about arugula for a second. So arugula is a very common lettuce type plant that you get in the grocery store. It's in a lot of summer salads. It's in a lot of salads that have Waldorf type dressings or your sweeter dressings. And you find that a lot because arugula has somewhat of a tart and peppery taste. So it complements your sweeter salads a lot more than just your common lettuce, like a romaine lettuce, for example, which is just a, I don't know, you think romaine and you think of Caesar salad, right? Am I the only one? No? So this right here is all common arugula. Now arugula is exceptionally easy to grow. It doesn't require a lot of work. It doesn't have to have super special soil. It is very frost hardy. You can grow arugula down to six degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty stinking cold. I mean, I won't go outside if it's like 40 degrees. So six degrees is pretty amazing. Not to mention any extra is something it's, the chickens love it. So you can always use common arugula for salads. You can use it for feeding your chickens and it's easy to grow. Why not grow a ton of it, right? So we're gonna harvest this. You can also juice arugula too. We do a lot of juicing in the winter, mustard greens, arugula, kale, things of that nature. It doesn't taste good. I'm not gonna lie to you and be like, oh my gosh, all this green juice, it tastes so good. It doesn't, it does not taste good. It tastes like green juice. Now you can add things like apples and oranges and whatnot to it to help it not taste so bad, but you're still drinking your salad. So there's that aspect to it. It's really, really healthy for you though. And if you can get past the yuck factor, it's, it just helps you feel a lot better overall. It's full of vitamins, minerals, nutrients. It's really good stuff. So we're gonna harvest some of this arugula, take this inside, and we're gonna have a salad tonight for dinner. Also, arugula is really great for the cut and come again method. You can do it just like you do your other lettuces and that way you don't have to lop the whole plant off. So, common arugula, we're gonna all right, so if we continue on throughout the rest of the bed, you'll see we have a few nice lettuces coming up really good. And our green onions right here, we're gonna go ahead and harvest quite a few of these because if you can see, a lot of the tops have fallen over. So there is no special reason as to why I cut our green onions off when they have fallen over. It's not signaling that the plant is done or it's gonna stop producing. It's a normal 
type of behavior for green onions. I, however, feel like the garden looks a tad bit tidier when the green onions are standing straight up and down. And since I'm kind of a lazy gardener, this is the one thing that I can continue to do that helps it look a tad bit neater. I believe in the path of least resistance in your gardening, meaning don't do more work than you have to. So these will get taken inside. They'll be put on baked potatoes or in salads, or we'll put them in the dehydrator, grind them up and make onion powder. We are definitely gonna need another basket today. Here's another look at our three stemmed Swiss chard that I talked about last week. All right, so all along down here in this bed, these absolutely gorgeous bright green heads right here. This is Southern Giant Curled Mustard. So as the name suggests, Southern Giant Curled Mustard is mustard greens that are grown in the South. They have these really beautiful curly heads on them and they are actually really good. We like a lot of spicy food in our diets here. I am probably the chief spicy food eater my husband comes in after me and then my oldest daughter right after that. They're all big spicy food lovers, but I definitely take the cake. The great thing about Southern Giant Curled Mustard is that although it has a spicy flavor, it's not actually spicy. You're not gonna be like, oh my gosh, this is too much for me. It's really, really good. I think of it like a spicier version of kale. And so we use it in soups. We use it cut up in salads. You can saute it with bacon because everything is better with bacon. There are actually a lot of uses for Southern Giant Curled Mustard or mustard greens in general. So if you haven't tried growing them, trust me, it is worth it. They are delicious. If I'm not gonna lie to you about green juice, I'm not gonna lie to you about mustard greens. They're actually really good. And again, all you have to do is that cut and come again method. You can just harvest greens all the time. All right, so in between some of these giant Southern Curled Mustards, we have some rutabagas that are growing. These are doing really nicely. I'm super excited about rutabagas because if you don't know, they are amazing. As you can see, we've got peas all along here. We're starting to get lots and lots of blooms, which is really exciting. Plus, it's really pretty in the garden to have a little bit of flowers here and there in the winter. This is Marlowe lettuce. Over here we have a couple of broccolis and Paris Island lettuce in through here. So it's just kind of a mix of things at the moment. All along the edge of the bed, you'll see that we have baby garlics that are coming up because it's been really sunny and nice. And when I say sunny and nice, I mean yesterday it was 72 degrees. We were all outside enjoying the weather, shorts, short sleeves, it was beautiful. It's like 50 degrees today, it's awful. <laughs> okay, on a really exciting note, I was able to eat my first pea from the garden yesterday. It was amazing. I love peas, they are fantastic. These are, um, Mammoth Beauty peas right here. I think that's what they are. What are you? So these peas right here, these are Mammoth Melting Peas. I love peas from the garden so much. They're so good. This is the second one we've been able to eat so far this year. Everybody in my household was super annoyed with me that I got to have the first pea and I didn't share it. Okay, how do you share a pea with seven people, first of all? And second of all, I grew this garden, this whole thing. It was me. I can rarely get somebody to come out and help in here, so I deserve the first pee, right? You're so good. And as you can see, there's more peas that are growing. There's plenty of blooms. We are super duper excited about all the peas and all the possibilities for the peas. This right here is English thyme. It was planted in just a regular cluster and through here. I am going to dig this up and separate it, probably in the spring. Okay, that is incredibly fragrant, by the way. You run your... That smells really good. Okay, now that you probably think I'm a weirdo. I have a tendency to use the garden beds as a seedling tray. Because we have so much space and it's just like, why not utilize it to the best of our ability? So this English thyme that's right here was just planted in a run. And I'm gonna let it develop a pretty decent root system before I move it around the property but English thyme also has benefits for repelling certain bugs like mosquitoes and other pests, which is great, given the fact that we live in the South and there are a lot of mosquitoes in the summer. So, and it's a wonderful herb to use in seasoning, chicken, and it smells so good. <laughs> now this section right here, these are also mammoth melting peas. They're doing exceptionally good. By far, I would have to say that the mammoth melting peas are doing the best growing so far all the way down through here. All the peas look lovely. 
Now over in this bed, right in through here, we have some dill that is growing and some very, very tiny brassicas. This right here, this is all cilantro. Now this bed houses the majority of our purple of Sicily cauliflower. That is what all of these gorgeous plants are right through here. These are daikon radishes that are growing. Daikon radishes are one of our favorites. All radishes are really good, but daikons are also great. We come through and we snip off the lower leaves from time to time that helps the plant to focus on being healthy. You can see there's no head forming yet. The plants are still super tiny, so. All right, over here, you can see that the calendula hasn't really done much, but it's still growing very slightly and it's still beautiful and green. Calendula does pretty well in the colder temperatures. This right here is all broccoli starts. This is kind of like the broccoli seedling area. This is Waltham 29 broccoli. And then you're gonna see a few different lettuces mixed in. This is Romanesco broccoli that is starting over there or Romanesco cauliflower, depending on how you wanna look at it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Romanesco broccoli is technically a cauliflower. We call it broccoli, but it's not actually broccoli. It's a type of cauliflower. So fun garden facts. You can see once again we have a bunch of radishes that are planted in between our brassicas. This right here, these are green Marcietta cauliflowers. It's a big beautiful fluffy plant. This is a collard plant. Wanted to update you on our big giant cabbages really quickly before we end the garden tour this week. These beautiful fluffy green plants that you're seeing right through here. These are our giant Sapporo cabbages and all the way down. And you can see that these are significantly spaced apart. I hope that you're getting the depth of how far apart these are planted. These are probably planted anywhere from two to three feet apart in this bed all the way down because these cabbages can get up to 40 pounds. They are humongous. They are monstrous cabbages. And I wanted to give them as much room as I could to let them really grow to their fullest capacity. So. So that's pretty much it for the garden tour this week, guys. That's where we're gonna wrap it up. That's where we're gonna end it. Hopefully next week when it is time to film the garden tour, it will not be too cold out. Otherwise, the garden tour might be delayed because as much as I love you guys, I'm not going to come outside in 30 degree weather to film a garden tour. It's not gonna happen. Mm -mm. We'll do something inside that day. <laughs> There's no way. So I'm Natasha. This is the kitchen garden at Shepherding Peppers Farm. I'm gonna have to start separating that now, kitchen and garden versus the other gardens because we are in the middle of planting the other gardens, the rose garden, the tea garden, all that stuff. So I'm excited. I want a whole farm full of different gardens one step at a time. So again, I'm Natasha. This is the kitchen garden at Shepherding Peppers Farm and I will see you guys next time. Bye y'all.